Well, I want to introduce to you a gentleman that I have gotten to know and know that he is a real man of God and a man that truly loves Jesus with all of his heart. Ushers, would you please help down here? Okay, there we go. And um, I want to introduce to you a man by the name of Tom Ford. Tom Ford has been um, a gentleman that has uh, come into our life here at Faith Outreach Center, and he, uh, the ministry that this man has, as I think, is a very, very powerful ministry, and one that I think we will see in the future as an individual that will really minister the Word of God. Right now, put your hands together for Mr. Tom Ford. Hey Amen. Can we give God praise, family? I don't want you to give me praise. Give God praise. Can we do better? Than, can we stand up and give God praise? Oh, come on. Oh, come on. We can do better than that. Oh, can we do better than that, family? Can we give God praise? He's deserving of our praise. He's deserving of our worship. Regardless of what we're going through, he deserves our praise. Amen? He's deserving of our praise. I thank God for uh, Pastor George, um, his awesome wife, Sister Mickey, um, just for um, inviting us and just, again, being in our lives. Um, I've said to her, she reminds me a lot of my mother. Amen. And uh, I thank God for what God is doing here at this ministry. I thank God for what he's doing in the individual lives. Amen. Um, but God is moving. Somebody say God is moving. He's moving in our lives, even when we didn't think he was moving. Even when he didn't, we didn't think he was moving. So I'm so grateful and thankful for being a part of this family this morning. This, we are a family of God. Amen. We are in the same family. Amen. Amen. I want you to turn your Bibles uh, to Revelation chapter 12, uh, 7 through 9. I want to also give thanks to my, my beautiful wife. Uh, 22 years. We've been together 27 years. Amen. Uh, Lauren, for my son who's with us today. Our other son is in college at Mars Hills University in North Carolina. And our awesome daughter just graduated college who lives in uh, Virginia at this time. So I am so thankful and grateful for the family that God has entrusted me with, amen, and that to uh, lead them by his spirit, amen. And so I'm so grateful and thankful. I thank God for the leadership here. I thank God for the, the guys who pray with me upstairs, amen. Those guys are awesome, amen. I, I don't know where they are right now, but if you can put your hand I see a couple of them right here. <laughs> but, the, I mean, these guys prayed with me before I came downstairs. The sister Mickey met with me upstairs and talked with me. I mean, you, you, got, you got to be prayed up before you come down here. <laughs> I'm so grateful to God uh, uh, for that, and it was absolutely uh, awesome. I thank God for my brother, uh, uh, my neighbor Philip. Is he here? He's, there he go. And his awesome wife, uh, just, just wonderful, wonderful people. But I'm so grateful and thankful to God uh, for uh, that connection uh, with him. So are you there in Revelation chapter 12? Amen. When you get there, say amen. If you're not there, say oh me. Starting in Revelation chapter 7 through 9, in verse 7 it says, A war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail. Somebody said they did not prevail. Nor was their place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, 
that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast out. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. They were dishonorably discharged. They were dishonorably discharged. When you dishonor someone in the military, if you dishonor your command staff, they will dishonorably discharge you from the military. When we dishonor God, guess what he will do? He will dishonor. Listen, he will kick them out. You see, there were three sects of angels in heaven. They were warring angels, which was Michael. They were messenger angels, which was Gabriel. And then they were worshiping angels, which was Lucifer, the son of the morning. He became very prideful. And he wanted to exalt himself above God. And when he tried to do that, which is found in Isaiah chapter 14, starting in verse 12, he said, I shall exalt myself above the throne of God. I, somebody say I. Come on, somebody say I must die. He was dishonorably discharged. And then there was a rejoicing that happened. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Whoa. Somebody say caution. Somebody say caution. To the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you. Look at your neighbor and say, to you. Look at the other neighbor and say, to you. Amen. He's come down to you and to me. Having great anger because he knows that he has a short time. How many of y'all know that the devil knows that he has a short time and the church thinks that we have all the time in the world? God has called us to go ye, not sit ye. Go ye into all the world and make what? Disciples, baptizing them into what? The name of the Father. And of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He's called us to make disciples. Disciples are learners under discipline. Amen. You've got to have disciplined soldiers. Amen. You can't have anybody overthrowing the pastor and, and the first lady. You can't have anybody overthrowing the leadership. Amen. Otherwise, you'll be dishonorably discharged. God has called us to honor him and to honor those who lead us. Amen? He called us to do it. And so, I want to share with you this morning a story that I found. It was found very interesting. I had to transpose it. It took me about 10, 15 minutes to do it. And I thought it was, and it was from 1965. Some may have heard this before. Some may have not. I was born in 1969. Sister Nikki, I'm a young buck. Amen. I'll, I'm a young buck. But I transpose this thing because we're talking about warfare, family. How many of you know that everyone in here are dealing with some type of spiritual warfare? In our thought process, the moment you wake up, you're dealing with warfare. When you leave your house, you're dealing with warfare. When you're on your computer, you're dealing with warfare. When you're in a relationship, you're dealing with warfare. If you're married and you've been married one day, you're dealing with warfare. If you've been married 20, 30 years, don't get comfortable. It's warfare. You're, we're dealing with warfare. If you don't think you're dealing with warfare, you haven't seen anything yet. But this is the title of that message that I transpose. And it reads, if I were the devil, if I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I would want to engulf the whole world in darkness. I would have a third of the real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until, ha until I have seized the ripest fruit on the tree. Then I would... Do whatever is necessary to take over the United States. I would subvert the churches first with a campaign of whispers, with, a, with the wisdom of a serpent. I would whisper to you 
as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is just a myth. I would convince them that man created God and instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old, I would teach them to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington. Then I would get organized. And I'd educate authors on how to make literature exciting so that anything else would be dull and uninteresting. I would threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I would peddle narcotics to whom I would or could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction and tranquilize the rest of them with pills. If I were the devil, I would soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves until each were consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have some, messing, uh, some mesmerizing media fanning the flames. Can anybody see that happening? If I were the devil... I would have schools to refine young intellects but neglect the disciplined emotions. Just let them run wild. Until before you know it, you would need drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I would have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon, I'd evict God from the courthouse, the schoolhouse, and from the Congress. Then in the churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would have pastors and priests, uh, I would lure pastors and priests into misusing boys and girls and the church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbols of Easter an egg and the symbols of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who want it. Until I have killed the incentive of the ambitious. What do you bet? I can get the whole United States to promote gambling. As the way to get rich, I would caution against extremes in hard work and patriotism and moral conduct. I'd convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned and swinging is more fun. That what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus, I can, I can undress you in public and lure you into bed with diseases which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I would keep doing what he's doing. If I were the devil. What am I saying, family? It's time for the church to awaken from its sleep. Amen? Oh, come on, family. We can do better. It's time. I'm speaking to myself. You think I'm speaking to you. It's time for the church to awaken from its sleep. How many of y'all know we eat and we go to sleep? Amen? We call it the itis and all of this other stuff, right? We eat, we get tired, and we go to sleep. I mean, I was really tired one day. I was, I'm retired from the Maryland State Police. And so I was driving one day, and I found myself off the road in the police car. I said, oh, my God, how did I get here? Well, I worked almost 20 hours one day. I just left the roadway coming off a ramp. And, of course, I played it off by getting out of the vehicle, looking around the vehicle, 
seeing as if everything was okay. And I got back in the vehicle and took off. I said, oh, my God, I got to stop doing this. Church, we have fallen asleep. Subconsciously have fallen asleep. God has called us to wake up. He's called us to wake up. We must be watchful. Look at your neighbor and say, we must be watchful. We've got to be watchful. Not just natural with our natural eyes. We need to be watchful spiritually. We're spiritual beings. We're body, soul, and spirit. When we're born again, our spirit man is born again. Your flesh can never be saved. But your soul has to be renewed, and my soul has to be renewed on a daily basis. Otherwise, the enemy is going to come in like a flood. And you won't have anything to rise up as a result of the enemy coming in like a flood. Amen? And so look at uh, Matthew chapter 13. Verses 24 and 25. The Bible says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. And while men slept, somebody say, while men slept. Uh, it's talking about both male and female now, okay? Not, not just talking about the men. Both male and female. We're all spiritual beings. We understand the order of God. The man is the head of the house and all this. Amen. But we're talking about everybody. Amen. So the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed into the field. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And what did he do? He went his way. The enemy's not concerned about staying at your house. He wants to come in and sow seeds of negativity, seeds of uh, 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 thievery, seeds of stealing. See, he wants to destroy your mind, causing you to lose your mind and ultimately destroy you and your family. The enemy has sown tears of selfishness and division into marriages, and he went his way. The enemy has sown tears of selfishness. He has sown uh, uh, tears of confusion into men and women today, and he went his way. Did you hear about the new law on Target? That you can't go into the... Uh, uh, you know, whatever you identify with in, in terms of your gender, I can go into that bathroom. Okay, I know I'm a male. God created me male. Amen. When I came out, God said, uh, my mother said, this, hey, it's a boy. It's a boy. Okay? We're not confused. Satan is the author of confusion. So they're saying that whatever you identify with, when you go to a bathroom at Target, then that's the bathroom you, you go into. So if I send my daughter to the bathroom, thank God she's 26 now. <laughs> but God forbid, those who have small kids, you send your daughter to the bathroom and you're in this aisle and you're just waiting for her to come out. Somebody else may be in there who say, hey, listen, this is who I am. I'm confused. That didn't set well with me. But the enemy has sown tears of confusion into the men and women. He's sown tears of hate and anger and suicide into our youth and went his way. He's sown tears of competition and greed into the fivefold ministry. And he went his way. The enemy has sown tears of lies and foolishness in our government. And he went his way. Church, it's time for us to wake up. Satan cannot be everywhere at the same time. He's constantly moving to and fro on this earth. Seeking whom he may devour in the natural. If you saw a man walking down the street and they gave you a lookout on TV saying, hey, that's a thief. He's coming down the street. He's wearing this and that, so and so. What are you going to do? You're going to be looking out, won't you? 
Amen. So that's why we have to be in the spirit, family. We've got to be in the spirit so that we can see Satan because he's a spirit. And we can see the condition of this world today as a result of what he's doing. Just the other day, a pastor preached a powerful sermon. My wife and I listened to it. Oh, my God. You may have heard about it in Highland, North Carolina. Preached a powerful sermon. Then my wife says, uh, is that the guy? Because the message that he preached. Sunday, that Friday, he took his own life. I can't be a judge as to what happened. You can't be a judge as to what happened. We don't want to get religious and spiritual. No, no one knows. But this is what I do know. There was obviously no peace there. And ultimately, God says no one can snatch us out of his hands. No one means not even you. What can separate us from the love of God? There are people who quit in life, and we don't know why. That's why God has called us to reach them. That's why he's called us to reach people. Even if you don't like how they look, even if they don't wear what you're wearing, even if they got tongue rings everywhere, if they're tattooed all over the place, God didn't call us to be religious. He's called us to be relational. Can we give God praise for that? Amen? He's called us to be relational. We've got to catch them and allow God to clean them up. We've got to let God clean them up. He says, go. We've got to go, family. And there's a war going on every day. None of us, I don't care what you're wearing. I don't care if you're dressed up in nice, looking really cute, nice hair done, pay $150 or $200 for your hair done. It doesn't make a difference. You can be GQ down with Versace clothes and shoes, $195. It doesn't make a difference. The enemy's going to come at you. He doesn't care if you speak in tongues. He doesn't care if you pray 40 days a straight. He doesn't care. God has called us to be vigilant and to be sober. Amen. From the natural alcohol. Amen. And from the cares of this world. That's why he tells us to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. He really does care for us, family. Amen? God is a good God. We have to be on guard. Amen? Did you know that in this world, that you and I are going to have tribulations? It doesn't feel good when they come. It doesn't feel good when we lose a loved one. It doesn't feel good because all of us have, have lost someone at some point in time. It doesn't feel good. But all of us are going to have to go through. But God has called each one of us to encourage each one. See, the problem is when we're going through, we don't want to tell anybody. We don't want to tell anybody. You know why? Because the enemy wants to make you think that you're the only one going through it. When Scripture clearly says that if two or three are gathered together in his name, Christ says he shall be right there in the midst. Amen? God has called us to encourage the body, to encourage one another, amen, because the war is real. That's why you see me dressed up like this, amen, in the natural. You know that everything starts in the natural first, then the spirit. That's why you see me dressed up like this, amen, because, listen, I'm just showing you naturally of what's really going on. We've got to fight. We've got to be battle-dressed, amen. The church must be trained. We have to be trained. I have to train myself to get up every morning to pray for myself, for my family, then for the churches, then those who are coming to Christ. That's what Jesus did, family. He's our model. Amen. I love Paul. I love Moses. I love Joshua. I love all of these. Jesus has to be our model. Amen. Jesus got his, his high priestly prayer in John, the 17th chapter. Who did he pray for the first five verses? He prayed for himself. How in the world are you, are you, you praying for other people? Pray for yourself. Amen. 
When you're on an airplane, they tell you, to, guess what? Uh, if there's something going on in the cockpit, whatever, your oxygen comes down, make sure you put yours on first before you put somebody else on. I mean, doesn't this look foolish? You're trying to put somebody's oxygen on first. It doesn't make sense. Put theirs on. Put yours, put yours on first. Then put theirs on. Amen? And then after he prayed for himself, then he prayed for who? His disciples. And after he prayed for his disciples, who did he pray for? Those who would come to him through his disciples. We need to pray for ourselves more, family. If you're not built up, how can you build somebody else up? If you ain't got a dollar and somebody asks you for one, how can you give it? Encourage yourself in the Lord. Come on, tell your neighbor. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Come on. If you ain't got a neighbor right there, go tap somebody on the show and say, encourage yourself in the Lord. There are times when we're going through in our relationships, family. In your marriage. My wife can give you a whole story. She's like, what you going to say now? What you going to say? What you going to say? She had to encourage herself sometimes when I wasn't encouraging her. I've had to encourage myself and get in my closet by myself and come out differently. Amen. How many of y'all know when we go and pray, we should go in one way and we should come out differently? Come on, go in at Clark Kent and come out as Superman. Amen. Come on, family. How many of y'all like that? You go in sad and you come out like this. Oh, my God. This world's in trouble now. Isn't that what happened at Pentecost? Isn't that what happened at Pentecost? Come on. Were they up in that upper room? And when the Spirit of God came upon them, before they came upon them, they all were cowards. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will flee. Did they not run? After Pentecost? They tore the world upside down. There was no fear. None whatsoever, family. God wants us to be watchful. Amen? Let's set a guard. Proverbs 4, chapter, Proverbs chapter 4, 23 and 24 tells us to guard our hearts. Guard our hearts. So that's how I want your physical heart. Guard your mind. Somebody say, guard your mind. Amen. Come on, we can actually lay hands on ourselves. The power of God is on the inside of you, so I'm going to lay hands on my own mind. I'm going to put prints all over my head. Guard your heart with all diligence, because out of our hearts flow the what? Issues of life. Fort Knox has an awesome sophisticated system where it holds our gold reserve. Anybody familiar with that system? It can pretty much detect you driving there. It can tell you who's in the vehicle. It can tell you the color of that person. It can tell you your tag number. It can tell you how far you are. It can give you the speed of your vehicle as you're tri driving to the gold reserve. Amen? Watch this, family. We need to have that same system. Because you need to guard your mind from the enemy. He wants to use our mind as his playground. It's a playground. And that's why God tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, do not give place to the enemy. Look at your neighbor and say, do not give place to the enemy. Amen. He's saying, do not give up. Don't give him any opportunities. Don't give them any territory, amen. Don't give them a residence to reside in, amen. Don't, don't give it to him. Don't give him no place. Somebody want to argue it with, with you at work? Don't give the enemy any place. Somebody cut you off in the vehicle? Come on. Don't give him the finger. Come on, don't give place to the enemy. My wife and I, we were driving. No, normally my test took place. When I left my gun at home, when I did all these different things, and, and so my wife and I, we were traveling down the road, and we were in a mom and pop band at the time. We had all of the kids but little, and 
we, 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 we're driving. And, you know, I was just driving trooper speed. You know, trooper speed. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and so that's a little inside joke. <laughs> so, so I was merging. I was just merging. I just sped up to merge. Over. Y'all know how you do, right? I got a few people agree with me, right? <laughs> so I merged over. But when I merged over, I did, subconsciously, I didn't even think that I cut right in front of this person because that's how I drove. And so when I cut in front of the person, it's obvious that the person got really upset. Because when I got around the ramp and pulled off on the road, somebody sped up on the side and pulled a gun out like this. And he, he said, so, and I went. <laughs> no, I did. My wife was sitting right there. I come on, family. You got to humble yourself. <laughs> you got to humble yourself. I said, it pretty much <laughs> All right, all right. And I kept driving. And it was silence all the way home. You didn't think God was working on me? Telling me, Thomas, it's not you who's protecting me, it's me. But me, it was God protecting me the whole time. My wife, we just moved into our home, had our home built. 2002? It was 2002? Here it is. Somebody broke into our home. Samuel was a little baby. He wasn't six foot one like he is right now. He was a little baby. And we didn't have any garage door openers. We didn't have alarms or anything. We just moved in three, four weeks. And somebody broke into the home while she was home. They saw the purse on the back door. They opened up the window. My wife thought it was me coming through. And I said, no, that's not me. She thought it was me. And when they came in, uh, they went and took her purse. Then they saw her. They started to come. You said they started to come up the stairs, right? They started coming up the stairs. And she said, what in the world? And they scattered. What am I saying, family? When you are submitted to God, when you obey the voice of the Lord your God, your enemies may come in one way, but God will cause them to scatter multiple ways, family. It was God who was protecting my family. Some of y'all got that. And my wife called me. She says, Tom, somebody broke into the home. And I said, they did what? What? So now I'm driving trooper speed (laughs) to get home. And the Lord spoke to me. Slow your vehicle down. What can you do, Thomas, that I have not already done for your family? See, here it is. I'm trying to do it in my own might. He was teaching me to trust him. He's still teaching me today. To put my trust in him. To this very day. This very day. So we must guard. We must put a guard over our minds. And believe God. Look at your neighbor and say, believe God. Believe him. Even when things get tough for you. When the bills and the money start looking funny. In the bank account, believe God. Oh, it's easy to believe God and give him praise when you got a million dollars in the bank. Oh, it's easy. Oh, God, we bless your name. But then when you lose everything, then what? Can you do what Job did? Can you do what Job did? Fall on his knees. Shave his head and begin to worship God and begin to praise God. And he never lost Distraction. He didn't get distracted. Although his wife said, curse your God and die. She was worrying about her babies too. But Job was focused. And he began to worship God. And he began to pray to God after losing everything. Family, we've got to get into our war room. 
and begin to pray. And begin to pray. Stop trying to do it alone. For man's ways seem right to himself, but the end thereof is destruction. I've messed up a lot of things in my own life trying to do it my way. Then I fell in love with this passage in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and he gave himself for me. But then I made it very personal and then I put my name where the I was because it's not about I. We've got to get out of this I mentality. We live in a world of iPhones and iPads and IMAX theaters. And it has distracted us from God. And I'm going to tell you, I'm a part of the iPad part. I mean the iPhone. And then I, and the Lord convicted me. He said, listen, Thomas, you got to get rid of this I thing because it's not about you. You say, wow. Thomas has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer Thomas who lives, but Christ who lives within Thomas. And the life that Thomas lives in the faith, in the flesh, Hey, man, I forgot where I was. Thomas has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I, Thomas who lives, but Christ who lives within Thomas. In the life that Thomas lives in the flesh, Thomas lives by faith in the Son of God who loved Thomas and gave himself for Thomas. Hey, man, can we give God praise for that one? Hey, Amen. You got it right. Let us guard our mind from divisions, family. Can we guard our minds? You know God hates division. He hates division. Stop thinking of, hey, I'm getting out of this relationship and I'm going to go into another one. Guess what? You're going to do the same thing. Somebody say, hold steady. Hold steady right there where you are. It's just a test. Not from the emergency broadcast system, but from God. He's using the enemy to test you. Don't you know the enemy is a servant of God? Don't you know that the enemy will, God will use that enemy to bring you back where you need to be when you start straying off like a sheepdog? He's a servant of God. But when the church begin to submit themselves unto God, then they can now resist the devil, and now the devil will flee from us. Amen. Somebody say, resist the devil. So, somebody say, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Amen. Let's guard our minds from divisions. Let's guard our minds from divisions. Romans 16, 17 through 19. If you have it, say amen. Romans 16, 17 through 19. I heard an amen real quick. The end of Romans. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you, which you learned and avoid them. Somebody say avoid them. I had to do that with the state police. We were all brothers. But man, some of them, ugh, I had to pray for them from a distance. Military as well. Makes no difference. Until they grow up, you have to do that with some people in church. Amen. God's called us to love each other. Amen. Come on, family. But until they grow up, don't look down on them. Don't look down on them. Avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by smooth words and flatter and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. And these are, it's a bunch of them, has deceived. 
How in the world can you tell her? How can you stand up before the entire world and tell them it is okay for a man to marry a man and a woman to marry a woman? But the way I see it, the way I see it is the same way God needed Judas to work out the plan of God. He'll use Obama to do the same thing. Nobody likes it. I hate it. I hate it. But God has called us. I want us to guard against unprofitable disputes. How many of y'all know we can dispute over things that really don't matter? How many of y'all know we can really uh, dispute over things that, that, that cause more division? We're disputing about money. You ain't got enough money. Oh, my God, you need uh, oh, oh, Lord. People are divorcing over that. Amen? Look at Titus 3, 8 through 9. Titus chapter 3, verse 8 through 9. When you get there, say amen. Amen. Where's Titus? Right before where? You said after 2 Timothy? It's only a test. Titus 3 verses 8. This is a faithful saying. And these sayings and these things I want you to affirm constantly. That those who have believed in God should be careful to maintaining good works. These things are good and profitable to men. But avoid. Somebody say avoid. Avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and striving about the law. For they are unprofitable and useless. That's why I, my wife would tell you, I was always talking about what the government wasn't doing and all these people weren't doing. And I was losing my time that God has given me. Amen? Because guess what? They're going to do what they want to do, but I'm going to do what God has called me to do, and that's to pray for them. Amen. When I pray for them, my mind is right. My heart is pure. Uh, I don't have any motives of going out there trying to take him out. Amen. But the more and more I stir myself up with a whole bunch of hate and whatever the case may be, now guess what's going to happen? If I have that desire, I may try to do that. So God has called me and called the church to be different. Somebody say operate in a different spirit. Amen. God has called us to operate in a different spirit. He has given us a ministry of reconciliation. Amen? This last passage right here before we close. Amen? But 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Thank you so much for being patient with God. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. I'm going to start here at verse 17 because that's where it, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become, behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of what? Reconciliation, where a person who was once friends, but no longer friends anymore. Now God has called us to reconcile that friendship. But more so what God is saying here, he wants us to reconcile ourselves to him. First, in a relationship, it has to be to him. We don't, my wife and I, we've already, we don't have to prove anything to each other. It's to God. Amen? It's to God. And God only. And yes, I do have to ask my wife to forgive me. But we have to reconcile ourselves back to God. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing. Somebody say, not counting. 
not counting their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation. Somebody say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Amen. I'm sorry, God. I've messed up. I've missed the mark. Amen. I missed it. And I'm sorry, God, that I missed it. Amen. I missed it. God has called us to get back into his presence. Amen. He's called us, the church, to pray. How many of y'all have a daily prayer schedule? Amen. Come on. It's good that you don't. It, I, I love it because we're in church too. Scripture says if we lie, we die. Amen. The soul that sins shall what? Surely die. Amen. So we're in church. We're being honest. Family, I'm here to tell you, get into your prayer closet. I don't care if you spend one minute in there. Start giving God something. Amen. He, he's given everything. Give him our best. Amen. Come on, family. Listen, we've got to get back into his presence. Why? Because guess what? That's where you're going to find joy, and that's where you're going to find peace. Family, that's where you're going to find all of these different things, pleasures. Psalm 1611 says, in his presence, there is what? The fullness of joy. How many of y'all have fullness of joy before? Come on. In his presence, there is a fullness of joy, and at his right hand, there are what? Pleasures forevermore. Pleasures forevermore. The night is almost gone, family, and the day is almost near. Therefore, let us, let's stand to our feet. Let us, Romans 13, 12 through 14, let us lay aside deeds of darkness. Look at your neighbor and say, lay it aside. Let's lay aside deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Put on God's armor. I've got armor on right now. He says, put on the full armor of God. But he says, put on the armor of light. The spirit, bless you, sir. Put on the armor of Light, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing or drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife, not in jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Can we give God praise for that family? Every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your people. I thank you for the word that you have given me to give to your people, Father. Now, I pray, Father, that they will respond to your word. If there's anyone in here that does not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not talking about joining a church. We're not talking about joining some club or being a part of this group or that group. It's all about souls. If you don't have that relationship, if you've never confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never asked him to come into your heart, you've never asked him, you didn't believe that God raised Christ from the dead after Christ died for us. And if, if you don't believe that, I want to give you an opportunity to believe on him today. Why? Because tomorrow is not promised for any of us. Amen? Tomorrow is not promised for anyone. My friend, police officer friend of mine, sat there with him for 15 minutes eating Popeye's chicken in Maryland. A half hour later, he's under a vehicle, dead. I missed it. I didn't even have an opportunity to even mention Jesus to him. I didn't even say anything to him about Jesus. I don't know. I don't know. Is that you today? You don't have any protection in your life that if something ever happened to you, that you would be in the presence of God. If that's you and you want to receive Jesus Christ today, I want you to lift up your hand so I can pray for you. Amen. Anyone. 
Amen. Praise the Lord. The church is saved. That's an awesome thing. But now, if you guys are going through, families that are going through, I want my wife, the pastor, even leaders, to pray for you. We want to pray for you. Amen. If you want to come up right now for prayer, we want to pray for you. The enemy's been attacking your family. He's been attacking your marriage. He's been attacking your children. I want you to come. I want you to come. I want you to come. Amen. This is not, you're a single man, and the enemy's been attacking you with pornography. He's been attacking you with all different types of lusts. He's been attacking you. Amen. And you're trying to figure out, I, I don't know how to shake this thing. I, I, I don't know what's going on. You're a single mom. You're a single mom. And you want, and you're looking for a husband. Amen. And the enemy's attacking you left and right. I want you to come. I want you to come. Amen. I want you to come so we can pray for you. Amen. God wants to touch. He wants to touch your marriage. He wants to touch uh, your children. He wants to touch your family. Amen. Anyone. Amen. One, the whole family. Praise the Lord. Amen. So we all, we're all good. Amen. We're all good. Amen. So I want you to pray for the ones that have come up here. Amen. Those who have come up here, I want you to pray for them. I want you to pray for them. Tomorrow is not promised, family. Has anybody ever suffered anything, gone through it, and you were victorious? Amen. You've been victorious? Well, this is where God wants you to now help others to become victorious. Amen. He wants us to become victorious. And so I am so grateful and I am so honored and I am so thankful that I had the opportunity to come here and minister to this awesome congregation and before this awesome woman of God. Thank you so much. God bless you, family.